Thanks. Good afternoon. You've just heard one of the great avant-garde works of all time, and now after that you'll have to endure 10 minutes of only me talking, so I'm sorry about that. I think you've just witnessed uh, what, in my opinion, is actually a significant cultural event. Groupin uh, has been around for long enough and has been played enough times that we know for sure now that it's an unqualified masterpiece of not only contemporary classical music, but classical music at large. It has that status uh, in the community. Unfortunately, because of the uh, many obvious reasons, it's not performed as often as we would like. It's a huge logistical challenge. The first thing you notice about the piece right after you come in, before you've heard any notes at all, is how big it is just size-wise. It takes 109 musicians that make up three orchestras and takes up three conductors to make the piece go. And besides that, now that you've heard it, you also know that it takes a great deal of technical virtuosity from everyone involved. So with those facts in mind, there's a couple of immediate questions that pop up. The first is, why is this piece like this? Why are there this many people involved? Why, why does Stockhausen need this force to make this music happen? And the next question that might pop up is, why are we here today doing this piece? Why is this an important thing to happen today? Why aren't we just playing another masterpiece uh, that involves far less people and we could much easily do? I'll tackle that first question in a few minutes, but uh, the second question entails a very easy answer the musical content of Gruppen is very strong. Stockhausen was a meticulous craftsman, one of the great craftsmen of classical music, certainly of the 20th century. And so the very strength of the musical material alone elevates Gruppen past only a visual spectacle. It is actually a true masterpiece beyond what you see. Although that being said, it's an amazing spectacle. It's a wonderful spectacle, and you just got to see that, and very few people do. The piece was composed between 1955 and 1957. So when I hear that, the first thing I think is, that was a long time back. This isn't a new piece. This is, in fact, uh, relatively speaking, an old piece. There's been decades of avant-garde music composed since this piece. This is accepted as a major piece of the repertoire. Now think about what's going on in that time a little bit with me. For the couple of decades following World War II, I think we all know this. Everything changed. I'm not talking about only music, but I'm talking about a great deal of Western civilization. Everything had to change after the end of World War II. We had to find something new after that for ourselves. And music composition is that very same way, uh, if not more so than many other facets of society. So during that little time after World War II, there was a predominant mode of composition. I'm gonna speak about it in just the most general way. It's any, any, any manner in which a conductor finds his or her material by using systems that are either mathematical or otherwise somewhat formulaic in nature. That's the thing that's essentially new after World War II, although it had been a long time coming. Stockhausen, even though he was an individual and had an amazing imagination, was right at the forefront of that predominant uh, efforts in composition. He was the primary craftsman of, of that kind of music. A term for most of that kind of music is serial music, by the way. It doesn't matter if you know the term, but much of the music I'm talking about fits that definition. Systems of finding musical material, by which I mean pitch, duration, rhythm, and pretty much any other facet of music, uh, by mostly mathematical means that are divorced from traditional harmonic thinking. Stockhausen was doing that, and he was doing it very, very well in the years following World War II. But so are a number of other composers. That's not why Stockhausen reigns and Gruppen reigns as among the most legendary musical artifacts of the period after World War II. The reason why this is so important, why, why Gruppen is a masterpiece, is because Stockhausen was a great craftsman, but on the other side of that equation is uh, his gift of imagination. That's what separates very good composers from potentially legendary composers. Stockhausen had a one-of-a-kind talent of imagination that comes along maybe only one or once or twice per generation. 
I'd like to put Groupon in context a little bit for you in the context of Stockhausen's other works uh, very briefly. We'll use this as a way for you to, to think about how this relates to his catalog, but maybe more importantly for you to think about how Stockhausen took that incredible gift of imagination and used it throughout his career. We've already said that Groupon was from 1955 to 57. Now compare that with this fact. Stockhausen started composing only in 1950, when he was 22 years old. Groupon is only his sixth piece, save a couple pieces of juvenilia. That means five years after he composed anything of merit, he composed one of the most important masterworks of any time. It takes an exceptional person to do that. The piece that immediately followed Groupon is uh, another piece along the same lines. Uh, I should say the most important piece that immediately followed Groupon, there are things in between, is called Carré. It's a similar makeup to this. Now think about this for a moment. Think about to what uh, end this piece goes dramatically. And now think about Carré, the next major work. It's for four orchestras, four choruses, and it requires four conductors. That work was completed in 1960. This piece, Groupon, and that piece, Carre, are the two major works from that period of Stockhausen's outputs. Everything he was doing around that time deals primarily with different musics moving against each other at different rates of speed. That's what happens all the time in Groupon, and that's basically why there's three conductors. So there can be different musics moving at their own tempo, not the tempo of everything else going on. That's what Stockholm was, was interested in between, say, 1950 and 1960 or so. Let's fast forward a little bit and talk about some of the later pieces. Increasingly after uh, 1960, Stockhausen was interested in improvisatory elements. Uh, improvisatory elements in classical music is one of the hallmarks of modern composition in the later part of the 20th century. Let me give you one quick example. He wrote a solo for a percussionist called Zeklus, uh, which means circle, and the score is this way. Uh, you can read it normally, uh, it's all normally, but you can read it one way, or you can take the score, flip it around 180 degrees, play the piece that way, still reading left to right. And you can start on any page you want of that piece, provided that you go through all the pages and get back from where you started. Uh, within that rubric, all the music is very specifically composed. All the, all the music is, is careful, just like Groupon. It all has this uh, Germanic quality of great detail and craftsmanship. But he gives uh, uh, the performer possibilities. He's doing that increasingly throughout the 60s. Now listen to this. He keeps doing that. He gives more and more freedom to the players. There's a piece in 1968. He's arrived at an idea that he calls intuitive music which is completely improvised music, but without thinking about it. That's why it's called intuitive music. He's trying to give players a framework to create music that comes out in the most instinctual way possible, without thinking about what you're doing. In 1968, there's a famous piece like this. It's called Austin Sieben Tagen, uh, which is the seven days. There's 15 pieces in, in this cycle. It's all composed in that year. The majority of those pieces have no notes in the score, no pitches in the score. The vast majority of them have no staff paper in the score. And in fact, right now, I'm going to read you the entire score for the most famous piece from that set. What I'm reading you now is not the instructions that accompany the score. I'm reading you the score, the only thing that the performer has. Live completely alone for four days, without food, in complete silence, without much movement, sleep as little as necessary, think as little as possible. After four days, late at night, without conversation beforehand, play single sounds. Without thinking which you are playing, close your eyes, just listen. That's the score, that's what the performer receives. Now, regardless of what you think about the merits of the content of that composition, all of us can agree that that displays his imagination uh, vividly. It's on the complete other end of modern composition, but, but it's the same newness that Groupon is. It's all from the same man. They're completely different pieces. It's also not performed very often. <laughs> 
Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, Stockhausen obsesses over one piece for a very long time. From 1977 to 2003, he's back into traditional notation. He's back into being a master craftsman on the staff paper, and he works on one single piece for that entire period, 77 to 03, uh, but that's a very large piece. It's a mammoth operatic cycle uh, called Licht, or Lights in German. It's seven operas. Each opera stands for one day of the week. It's the only piece he works on for that entire period of time. And think about that for a moment. One of the hallmarks of a great composer and a great artist is the ability to think about large architecture. Stockhausen does that better than maybe any other composer of the 20th century. He thinks about this one piece for 20 plus years, and he's also able to find a curve in all of his pieces, a journey, that feels very unified in a way that m most composers can't. It's one of the primary hallmarks of a great artist. Think about the theater that Gruppen entails, how dramatic it is. There's a lot of motion in the piece, although it's strict strictly speaking, there's no dramatic narrative. Now, let's think of, I'm gonna give you one example of one scene from one opera of Liszt. It's the most famous scene. It's from the opera entitled Wednesday. Think about how the idea of Gruppen has exploded for Stockhausen. It's vastly more dramatic uh, than we ever thought possible previously. This scene is right in the middle of the opera. It involves only four musicians. It involves a string quartet. Sounds pretty simple so far, but uh, here's the other thing about that. Each string player in this one scene of an opera has his or her own helicopter, an actual helicopter. And during that piece, there are four helicopters, one with each string player, flying around above the concert hall. If you saw the score for that, you'd be amazed at how specifically notated the piece is. The sound of the propellers in that piece are a major facet of the composition, and he has that in the score too, the sound of the propeller blades. The musicians uh, coordinate with one another via microphones and headphones. And in the concert hall, there's a series of speakers and monitors, four speakers, actually eight speakers, and four monitors, and the audience sits there and watches what's going on and listens to what's going on in the helicopters. That's not only one piece, it's one scene of one opera, and that one opera is from a cycle of seven operas that Stockhausen spent over two decades on. After that was finished, he didn't take a break, he started the next cycle, this is from 2003 to his unfortunate death in 2007. He works on a cycle of, of similar size to the operatic cycle called the Klang cycle. This one was going to be not seven days of a week, but 24 hours in one day. He's gonna write 24 mammoth pieces, uh, each of which were gonna be an hour long, so he could just play the whole piece in one 24 hour day. Unfortunately, he didn't finish that, but it was uh, of a similar scale. That gives you a little idea of his output. Uh, that being said, there, not all the pieces are of that size, but the conception is always of that artistic size. He wrote exactly 370 pieces in his lifetime, and I've only told you about a small smattering of them. Let's go back to Gruppen for a moment. I'd like to discuss a little bit about what the listening experience might be like. The other most obvious thing about the piece besides its huge size is the fact that it involves three conductors. It's unusual, obviously. It's not the first time that's happened. There were pieces from multiple conductors actually decades before Gruppen existed, but Gruppen is certainly the first very good work that involves multiple conductors, and it brought that idea to a more significant stature. There's now all kinds of pieces with multiple conductors. It's still not common, but there's quite a few of them. There's some that involve up to, say, 16 conductors, for example. It's all kinds of conductors and pieces. That wouldn't have happened if this piece hadn't happened, certainly. Something special about the conducting in this, besides the amount of conductors, the conducting is also very difficult. You probably noticed that to some extent. What they're doing is always changing, and it's always contingent on what the other two conductors is doing. This is an important facet of the piece because in the 1950s, that's the first time that composers are writing music that is self-consciously aware of the fact that the conductor must also do something technically virtuosic. 
much old music is, of course, difficult to conduct, but at this time, Stockhausen and also one of his famous colleagues, Pierre Boulez, are writing a body of music that is purposely very physically taxing for the conductor. That's a new thing, and I think you can tell already that the conducting is really enormously difficult in the piece, but for good reason. Let me go back to my first question. Why is the piece like this? Why does it involve this many people? Why are there three conductors? Why does it surround you? I think there's two basic reasons. The first is a poetic reason to some extent. Uh, it's not a poem, it's just poetic. And then the second reason is more pragmatic. And uh, for a little span of time, uh, before Stockhausen wrote Gruppen, he was spending time in the Alps, in the Swiss Alps, uh, just like an artist retreat situation. He was simply just there to write music uh, while being mainly alone. Being surrounded by mountains was his major inspiration for writing this piece. And I think to some extent, not to the complete extent, that's why you're surrounded by musicians during this. Uh, there's even a story that uh, while he was in this house in the Alps, he traced the mountains on the window and he used that also to come up with material for the piece. The pragmatic reason is that, as we've said, the piece is obsessed with music, moving at different rates of speed, and having the three orchestras around you uh, is simply a way to delineate the music for the listener, it's an aid for the listener. So not only is it this surround sound kind of experience, but it's also just a simple device to help you hear everything that's happening all the time. As you know now, much of the piece is really quite dense. I'd like to just say one small thing that might help you listen to the piece, but I want to preface it by saying that uh, listening to this piece, really listening to any piece, uh, requires no previous knowledge or understanding. It's not, you do not need to understand this music to enjoy it. We don't really uh, understand Beethoven either when we enjoy his music. It's the same situation. You just simply enjoy the sounds. That's all you need to do. But here's one little nugget for you. In the sparsest moments of the piece, the conversation between the orchestras is very easy to identify. We hear something in the brass here, something here, something here, back and forth, etc. Not necessarily that simple, but the conversation is easy to catch. Now when we get to the loudest, densest moments of the piece, it's the same way, but layered for the most part. There's a conversation upon a conversation upon a conversation upon a conversation. That's the primary way that the most climatic, loudest moments of the piece are built. And those conversations are usually between families of instruments. The brass have one conversation, the winds have another, the percussion have another. You might think about that at those few moments of the piece where it is truly cacophonous. Uh, there is a, a very clear delineation in that music. I'd like to leave you with, a, with a, a more abstract idea about what I think the piece is, maybe something that might help you uh, regard your experience listening to it. Consider this for a moment. Imagine that you're in front of uh, a beautiful tapestry, a masterful tapestry of the type that you would find in a museum. When you consider the whole, it's of course very beautiful, obviously very well done. And then when you consider it at the micro level, when you come close and see each individual strand on that, each little bit is also done very well. It's clearly crafted in a masterful way. So when you're that close, each piece is perfect. But when you back up, the whole is also perfect, but you can't see each piece anymore. That, we could say, is what any good piece of music is like, uh, almost. Certainly any good piece, I would say, from the 20th century each little piece is crafted perfectly, and the whole is crafted perfectly as well, but we can't always see the little pieces any longer. Now here's grouping to me. Take that tapestry and imagine that it's all the way around you 360 degrees. It's still a perfect masterful piece, but no matter how hard you try to look at it, you'll never be able to see the whole thing at once. You might consider listening to grouping to be that way. It's so big that you'll never be able to conceive of the whole piece, and that's a major part of the idea. You don't need to. You can shed your expectation of a complete listening of the piece. You just only need to have your personal experience inside of that environment. In a rehearsal last week, uh, Doug Weeks, who's conducting right here, he's responsible for all of this, uh, said that someone came up and asked him, what does this all mean? You know, a, a group in. What does this all mean? Why, why is this a year in the making? 
Why have you been rehearsing this for so long? What does that mean? And Doug's idea about that was asking that question is akin to asking what is the meaning of life? And I think there's, there's, some, uh, there's something very truthful about that correlation because like life, Groupon is too big and all-encompassing to reveal an answer to such a question. But I think I can speak for everyone when I say, given the choice between answers and the music, we'll always take the music. Thank you.